Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Heath, and I am the guest editor of Peregrine, Volume 7, Number 2, that came out in fall of 2022. Um, and welcome to Fly to Me, Speak to Me, a Peregrine Reading, which is a celebration of this issue that just came out. Um, I Oh, I have so many feelings about it. <laughs> it was such a wonderful uh, journey from start to finish. It was a delight to be invited by Yellow Arrow to work on this issue. Um, it came at such a wonderful time when I wanted to explore the things that we said and the things that we left unsaid. And also there's a travel element to many of these pieces that are included in the journal and to have it come together in such a beautiful way with so many amazing writers sharing their stories of their journeys through identity and how that taps into language and how travel taps into identity and language and relationship. There's just a lot of really cool stuff going on. Um, so I'm excited for those of you who have already picked up the issue, you probably are picking up on a lot of what I'm putting down. I'm excited for folks that are here this evening who maybe you haven't seen the issue and you get a chance to get a taste of what's in there and hopefully you'll pick it up. And um, we're gonna kick this off actually by just going through a few housekeeping things. Um, so as I mentioned before, we are recording this. Um, so we'll be spotlighting our readers, um, but if you'd prefer to stay off camera, you can do that. We do have live captions enabled for anyone who would like that. You just click those three dots under more and you can get those started. Um, while you, we are asking you to stay on mute throughout the reading, you can definitely send your love and affection for anything that you hear in the chat and also use the reactions function. That is, is really nice for readers to be able to see those reactions happening in the chat and also with the reactions function. Um, and we're going to be going through the reading um, kind of back to back so that we, we won't be pausing to applaud for folks after each reading. But at the end, we'll get our to unmute themselves and go crazy with celebration for everyone who has shared their work. Um, and at the end, if we have time, we'll also do a Q&A um, if you want to ask me or the writers anything about the process of putting work together. Um, and before we get into our first reader, I also want to just shout out our cover artist, Daryl Newman. Um, and I'm going to share my screen here um, so I can shout out this beautiful cover art. Um, this is the cover of Peregrine. Um, it was done by Australian artist Daryl Newman, um, who's not here this evening because she's in Australia, but I just want to share this beautiful piece. It's called Shay. Um, Daryl's art focuses on women and women's empowerment and the women in her life that have inspired her. Um, and this particular piece just really spoke to all of us um, who were putting together this issue um, about the journey that we all take um, and Peregrine is about that. It's about the journey. So I just want to take a moment to share this beautiful cover um, and shout out Daryl who um, shared her artwork with us. Um, so with that said, um, I also wanna say that even though Daryl couldn't be here, I did get the chance to sit down and speak with her about her art and her process and Annie just dropped the link to that interview in the chat. So I strongly encourage you to check it out. Um, she has an amazing story and, and anyone who loves the arts or is a creative person, I think would benefit from having a listen and having a look. Um, and with that said, the next thing I will drop in the chat is our order for this evening. Um, so we're going to be starting with Laura Rockhold and we will move through the list that you see here. Some folks could not join us. Live, but we will be sharing a recording Grace hour um, navigating through technology on that point. Um, and I think that's all of the disclaimers that I have to give. So I'm going to remove my spotlight and invite Laura Rockhold to share her piece. Hi everyone, um, I live in Minnesota and I'm 
so happy to be here. Thank you, Rachel and Yellow Arrow for including me in your beautiful Peregrine issue. Um, this theme deeply resonates with me. Um, and I'll just start off by saying a little bit about um, in the in the book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about naming and she talks about how um, names bring us um, into relationship with each other and the living world and into relationship with ourselves. And I find this to be true. And in my poem, um, I'm exploring my connection to um, myself and others and, um, and language and place through naming. Lichen blooms. I'm happy to slow down, to see the lichen blooms, aging, beauty, milfoy petals of pale mint, color the scent of vetiver on skin, leaflets of melon speckled blue, color light as kindness, blurring what it is to be too, fungus and algae and symbiotic reciprocity, a whole us. In Minnesota, Makoche, land where the waters are so clear, they reflect the clouds. I have been the water, and you, the clouds, blooming somehow for a coat of brilliance. Today will be different tomorrow. I can tell when you're feeling me, you move in a little closer, twirl me around to see. Victories still alive in me, dancing, you know. I gave up my name a few times before I claimed it. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Up next, we have Leticia. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Leticia Preby Rocha. Um, I currently reside in Medford, Massachusetts, so Boston adjacent. Um, I'm originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, and when I was nine, my family moved to Miami, Florida. Um, and this background is really one of the facets of myself that compelled me to write the piece that I'm going to share with you today. Um, as a poet, I've always been very drawn to translation, uh, the untranslatable, and how being human often feels like trying to communicate what simply isn't communicable. Um, and this is a poem that took me years to write. I, I had lines that I liked that always kind of pushed me to keep stabbing away at it. Um, and then this year, I experienced a heartbreak that just forced me to confront and understand that language is the key to the home that is the self and kind of brought this all together. So without further ado, here is Lost In. Though unquestionably it was vermin, I couldn't do it run over the rat scurrying across the street. A slice of me wanted to hit the gas. Driving away from the averted casualty, I searched to name that slice. To run over in Portuguese is atropelar, a harsh utterance efficient in its violence. There is no way to say I miss you in Portuguese. There is only saudade, an it that you possess for something someone. Finding photographs of streets I once walked, taken by my mother years before my birth. Googling the city of my first childhood, the top result, a bridge built two years after my flight. Losing my love for Pizza Hut following our last meal as a family before my father left. Saudade. A horrible man once told me, Guaranteed that atheists are fools for every person will someday be brought to their knees by something so dire they will want God to be real. Want, not need. I didn't understand that. Didn't understand that a want could be greater than a need, that I could become want. Driving past a tree, in the curved ridges of its trunk, I saw the Mother Mary, her leaves screaming in the wind. Saudade. A bowling ball of longing wedged in the middle of my chest, minuscule cracks pushed into ribs, lungs flattening, heart lopsided, beating, 
for skies that we will never see. Thank you. Those were both beautiful. Um, my name's uh, Rebecca Brock. Uh, I live in Virginia, but I grew up in Idaho and I've been a flight attendant for over 20 years. So um, I feel like I'm always homesick and never quite at home. And that definitely, when I saw the call for Peregrine, drew me to that idea of journey and travel. Um, I wrote this poem on an overnight um, in a hotel room. It's called Watching Mountains. Even though the room faces west, the sunset plays the mountains, and I see how long a day can be, well spent, standing still, and held there. Two white birds flicker with sunlight, the sky as if it might snow, that mist of fog. But then a late gasp of wide blue. I am in the city at the base of those mountains, a stretch of the Rockies caught between time zones, between here and back again. I stand at a hotel window naming want, those hills, I mean to be in them. What is time to a mountain beyond season, beyond sun, the gathering of rain, a mountain lion's call, the stone ringing with light, like a name that's learned to speak for itself. What is it to feel yourself unmoving? Any shift would rumble like bone crack, like cadence, the fall of rock or impact. They rest the way the sea sways, that wash of crash and pull. There is no pulse in a mountain, just the fact of its being as if to say here, just here, a reminder of what was, what is, and someday immeasurable, what will no more be? Thank you. So up next we have Christine Shu. Hi, um, I wanted to thank Yellow Arrow Journal for previously publishing my personal essay, Mother Tongues of Confusion, Shame, and Love. I am a poet, playwright, and essayist um, based in San Francisco. I resonated with the theme because uh, I've lived in many places. I was born outside of Chicago, raised near Houston, and lived in England, Belgium, New York City, and now California. Um, here's my poem. I hope you enjoy it. How how do you say no in Chinese? My Belgian boyfriend asked me this question when I was 22. I paused. I didn't know. Yes, I spoke elementary level Mandarin, but this question stumped me. Ironically, my white graduate student friend from the School of Oriental and African Studies explained, you have to have a verb to go along with the negative. Bu yao, I don't want. Bu, this no doesn't make sense. The Belgian and I didn't work out. He wanted a bu. For me, it was a buyani. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Christine. And next, we are going to have Ellen Stilton. Good evening, everyone. Um, I. Um, speaking to you from Vermont, I drove all day to get here, but usually I live in Philadelphia. Um, and everything about this, the focus of this issue are things that matter to me, language and home. And um, when I was in eighth grade, I, we had to do a, a speech about a hobby and I need, did mine about moving. <laughs> um, and my parents kind of freaked out, but um, <laughs> so, Anyway, I never expected that I would be divorced and then I was. And so that was a, a particular kind of um, dislocation um, of place and, and home. Um, so this poem is called, um, You Were an Apostrophe to Me. You were an apostrophe to me obscuring the sharpness of divorce debris and possessions, bitter aftertaste, aiding and embedding 
painful contractions. Everything went down so smoothly at first, and then an acid burn, a shot of whiskey on an empty stomach. The perpetual shrinkage triggered by sounds of angry footsteps on stairs fueled the salt of heartbreak. At dusk, I opened the window and tumbled into an abandoned church lot, the old sign missing vowels and the dumpster full of vows. I never liked the hyphen that joined our names either, but it will never be erased from my CV, offspring birth certs, my newest mortgage docs. You like the things he says, my best friend said in 92. But an apostrophe can possess with false sounds, constrain the cruel truth until the sentence ends. Oh, thank you so much, Ellen. Now, this is where we get to do some technology magic <laughs> because Rena Alori is our next presenter and Rena has pre-recorded her poem. And so I'm going to do my best <laughs> to make this happen without any hiccups. So let me share my screen. And of course, I forgot to also share the sound. One moment, let me share my screen and share sound. And Annie, I'll ask you if you can check in with me to make sure that you can hear and see. Hey everyone, I'm Rena Malagayo Aluri, pronouns she, her. Sending this reading to you from Salzburg, Austria, where I currently reside. The theme of peregrine, a migratory bird, speaks to me as someone who was born in Mumbai, India, to Indian and Filipina parents, raised in Nigeria on the African continent and migrated to Canada or Turtle Island and someone who currently resides in Europe. The use of writing and language allows me to reflect on identity, location and ancestral and learned tongues with a form of openness and vulnerability that is not always easy feasible or appropriate to do so yeah. in daily spoken life. What? What? I would like to share with you my poem. Kitchen Tales. Despite telling them I do not understand, they still switch back to Tagalog. I retreat, marveling at their ease sharing ideas, jokes, amid stories of ethnic conflict. Memories of family gatherings, a name uttered in the kitchen, incomprehensible sentences, a punchline. Titos, titas, lolos, lolas, roar in laughter. We will never know what kitchen tales have been told about us. When I ask why she never taught me, she explains I was stubborn. Only responded in English. It is so painful, a child who did not realize she was silencing her ancestors. When we fight, she reminds me of my linguistic advantage to formulate rage and frustrations, extensive accusations, in words I have always known. Angry, she struggles to tell me off in her third tongue. I wonder how beautiful it would have been if we could have yelled at each other in Ilocano. Thank you. Okay, so before we move to our next reader, who is Elizabeth Bowden David. I do want to just remind you folks, if you could please stay on mute um, during the reading so we can all enjoy those things uninterrupted. And I will spotlight Elizabeth now and go for it, Elizabeth. Thank you. So thank you so much for holding this reading. It's it's really exciting to hear from all of the other 
authors. And I think we have a lot in common. It sounds like a lot of us have moved from one place to another. Um, I'm currently in Bangalore, India, and um, the theme of Peregrine resonated with me because um, I'm kind of a permanent migrant and um, language or writing has been a way for me to process this and all it entails. So um, my essay is, uh, it's a bit longer um, and I'm reading an edited excerpt. Um, the beginning of it goes over um, a children's book that I really loved, which was called, Are You My Mother? And um, explores my relationship with my mother. For all my mother's sweetness, it bothered me early on that she didn't seem to jump into life the way I wanted to. She didn't swim because she didn't like to get her head wet. She always turned the radio down. She would fret endlessly about getting a thank you note just right, her pen swirling in invisible halting circles above the card before she was confident enough to ink the words. It was this nagging sense of otherness that prompted me to say the meanest thing in my life. I was about seven and she was putting me to bed. When I grow up, I'm not gonna be like you. What she felt, I don't know, but her reaction was all grace and lightness. That's all right, you can just be your own person. I wouldn't want you to be like me anyway. She kissed me goodnight and never mentioned it again. In defense of my seven-year-old self, what I probably meant was that I would do things she hasn't. This has come true. I have a career. I scuba dive. I throw parties. I bench press. By exaggerating a teeny bit, I can say I face down a hissing cobra. I dance in the kitchen. I cuss in front of the kids. And when someone tells me good news, I jump up and down and hoop and holler with unbridled glee. My father has been on the other side for decades now, but his presence feels nearly constant. So where is my mother's influence? When I look in the mirror of my actions, I squint, but she's nowhere to be seen. I've been pondering this question for years, and the answer that feels truest is rooted in my very first memory of life. I'm about four or five, I'm standing in front of the TV wearing an Auburn jersey and tough skins jeans from Sears. Caught off guard, I feel the rustle of something being dropped into my back pockets. When I rush my hands backward into the denim, I find that each pocket holds a piece of super bubble. I whip around, but the treasure giver has concealed herself behind my back. I delight at holding the red, yellow, and blue wrapped morsels in my palms while I hear my mother's gentle chuckle behind my ears. I suppose that's where she still is and where she has always been. And that's why I don't see her in the mirror. She's not inside me or around me, but behind me. She holds my back straight with her unconditional acceptance and she propels me forward with a sense of freedom to be my own self. I can crane my neck around to try to see her but really, there's no need. Just like the day she slipped treasures into my pockets, she has ducked out of view. She's right behind me, too close to see. Thank you, Elizabeth. Oh, that was so lovely. Oh, I don't know about anybody else, but I am having the best time right now. And we're going to keep the party going. We have another pre-recorded uh, share uh, from Catherine Reese. So I will pull up the screen share again here. And here is Catherine. I'm Catherine Reese. My poem is Glasshouse Mountains. It resonates with the theme of peregrine for me because there's such a deep sense of longing to fly home. And the Glasshouse Mountains, Sunshine Coast area is where my parents, where my grandparents lived and where I, would, I long to fly home to. Um, there's a mountain in at the end called Tibragagan. Glasshouse Mountains, the storm bird cries all summer 
never when it rains. Avian omens cannot be trusted. I take the range road, coasts splayed out to my left, scented with roadside lantana, mango, and open sclerophyll sweat. Mount Coulomb gathers clouds like a skirt. Come lie here, place your hand on my rock chest. The Marucci gives herself to the sea. I trace her shimmering, seeking mangrove blind bend my granddad fished. The footbridge picnic island. My great grandfather's farm now marked by a concrete pylon that lives a motorway over the river. Marucci, lover's tears. I belong to her estuarine embrace, her curves, her salty mouth. I leave her sandy kisses in my tangled hair, dream dark mangrove arms to reach, caress her grief. Humidity laced with lantana, this scent, this forest, my blood. Generations of hollow giants axe guard, fill with mushroom, moss, loam. Longer vines secure canopy to earth with long, loose stitches. Creek mud seeps, sleeps beneath the impending storm. Sacred water, sacred air slung with mosquito heat. We felled the forest to find no rich soil, only dust. Tibragagan weeps. His name has been restored, but not his land. Mm. So next up, we have Maria S. Tone. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, I'm a Korean adoptee, so when I saw the theme of travel, language, and home, it really resonated with um, the adoption chapbook that I'm publishing, and I'm working on extending it into a book. So, um, yeah, I, I'm going to read my poem, which is called They Need to Invent a Korean Word for Adoptee Sorrow. And it's inspired by Franny Choi's Hangul Abusterian. Gather up all us thousands, negated, disenfranchised from greater Han, like an embarrassing family member stashed in a Western country. But macro, scale of oceans rising, masticating sovereign shore, journeying back our livable land. Check our feelings on a Likert scale, Korea, home language we watered down to flood the wider world now pushing back against the carbon fired history we're burning from. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, I'm Elaine Ellenson. I'm, I'm uh, reading to you from some Francisco, I definitely want to thank uh, Yellow Arrow Journal and its editors, Rachel and Kapua, and all the people who worked on it. It's a beautiful edition. Uh, and I, like other readers tonight, found this theme of Peregrine uh, so provocative, being about language and journeys. And I want to thank my friend Minal for introducing me to Yellow Arrow Journal. And also, I want to thank um, the people of Chiquila, Honduras, uh, who welcomed me into their town, which is where this was written. Um, my piece is called Amanecer, Anochecer, From Dawn to Dusk. And uh, it's um, longer than three minutes, so I'm, I, I'll just read you some excerpts from it. Medio dia. The rooster crowing does not mean dawn. He does not follow the rules. He crows when the sun is high in the sky. Rooster is rooster and will crow at will. He will set the rhythms of the country, the background music against which the marimbas will play, the machetes will swing at stalks of sugarcane, water will be drawn from the river for drinking, strong hands will shape the masa and slap tortillas on the comal. With a crack, the sky opens and fat round raindrops splash on the broad banana leaves. The rain starts in the middle of the sun, shadowing the blue sky to black and gray splattering loudly, then disappears, leaving only puddles in the rutted street for toddlers to jump in and mangy dogs to bathe. Anochecer. The fading sunlight hits the pear-shaped wooden curves of the guitar. 
Don Chico's fingers fly in and out of the sun, only making music, not noticing the patterns they make on the panel of the wood worn thin by decades of strumming. Faded cornflower blue pants cover his long spider legs, crossed one knee over the other. A frayed straw hat is drawn over his dark eyes, casting a shadow on his gaunt cheekbones and black mustache. Muscles in his neck, like strong ropes, quiver as he croons. The boys head home from the milpas, stop for a swim in the river, wrestle and catch fireflies. Reaching their house, they grab a tamal sin pollo, kiss their mama, and gather around Don Chico. Eliberto, Orlando, and Manuel don't really know if they're still boys or if they're men. They barely notice the dusky sky slowly filling with pale stars or their mother lighting the lantern. They tap their feet to the cumbia and listen to their father's talk of soldiers and crops. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Tamiko Nimura. My pronouns are she, her. I'm on the Puyallup uh, Coast Salish Tribes lands in Tacoma, Washington. Um, a quick note of gratitude to my family, my friends, my summer 2022 Vona cohort who is here. And of course, gratitude to Rachel and Kapua and Yellow Arrow. This is called uh, The Essayist Reaches for Poetry. And I wrote it this summer. It's dedicated to Audre Lorde. First position. I was too brown, too round for ballet as a child. Pink slippers, not me, nude tights, always reaching away from ground. The Y teacher told my mom, weak ankles. I stopped wrote my first haiku. Second position. Essays, though, they say what you mean. Essays say, throw words around, maybe away. Clear your throat in an interesting way. State your thesis or your question. Same thing, then try, just try to answer. Five paragraphs, please, double-spaced. You know the form, dutiful, college-ruled. Isn't it easier? All my acrobatics transferred to the water. Third position. Poetry says, oh, but I'm swimming. I've got the flip turn. Check out my agility. Love my flexibility. Poetry barely ever comes up for air. Here, look for me, it says. Reach out. Research, reach me, tosses its hair, then it's gone. Fourth position, I never learned the flip turn. Okay, fine, now I can learn. Kiss your knees, forward flip, maybe use a nose clip. Don't flip all the way, then stretch out, touch the wall, not too high, not too low. Now, kick off. It takes practice. Learn it in an hour. It takes practice. Reach. Fifth position. Reach again. See the world upside down. Let the water hold you as you cut it with your hands, your legs. Reach again. Dance with bright blue freedom before you. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Diane Leo Omine, and I'm reading from Nissen and Land in Sacramento, California, in, in the United States. And I just wanted to thank Rachel and the Yellow Arrow team. The theme, Peregrine, 
speaks to me because grief is like a bird. And this is an excerpt from The Hawk. I spy a hawk on a levee, splayed out on harsh gravel. Who would hunt a, a bird of prey who was bold enough to take down a raptor? In Latin, raptor means to seize and carry off. The day she returned from the hospital, I called her on FaceTime. Because of pandemic related restrictions, no visitors were allowed at the hospital. Alzheimer's had otherwise frayed the mind of the grandmother I remembered from my childhood. Out of nowhere, she rattled off a roll call of our names in the village dialect in a pitch so clarion, no one could afford to be tardy. Rat tear to seize. Days later, she had a bad fall that sent her back to the hospital, a fall that took both the moon and sun out of her. I visited when she returned home, but that astonishing clarion from earlier had disappeared. I knew I would never see her again, as much as I hoped that she could stay to greet my child's birth. Raptor to carry off. Insiders and outsiders, loved ones and curious strangers, Chinese and not, wonder why I don't speak my family's language. They don't mean to be accusatory, but it grates on me when they ask. So don't you want to learn? Rap tear to seize. Our names are in a dialect no one will call out again. Names I can't bear to hear again, unless it's from my grandmother or my grandfather. It's not as simple as learning or not learning so much as it is untangling the murky ocean that is trauma. Rap tear to carry off. I spy a hawk perching on my grandma's porch. Brows growing inward, the hawk glares with promise. Sometimes the hawk makes the return. The hawk comes, the hawk goes. I give the hawk a name. I then ask my child, now a toddler, if he wants to see the hawk when it comes for a visit. I want to ask the hawk where it's been, why it keeps returning. There are different meanings applied to hawk sightings. But many I've seen suggest a hawk sighting is liberation, a vibration of higher awareness, awakening anew. I don't dig any deeper, but for now, pocket this newfound freedom like a stone. It just may have been a gift from her. Wrap tear to seize and carry off. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Diane, thank you, everyone. We have one more reading to share with you all, and then comes the fun part where we get to celebrate all of this beautiful writing. So this is another pre-recorded. So I'll share my screen one final time. And here we go. Hello, everybody. I'm Patricia. Patricia Falk. And I live in Pool, small city close to Cologne in Germany. Why writing about Peregrine, defined as having a tendency to wander? We as a species are the most invasive and migratory in the world. And as a biologist, I'm very much interested in every species which is drifting around and wandering and migratory. So, as for instance, the hummingbird hawk moth. Actually, I've developed a whole cycle of poems called Flotsam, in which I explore this um, migration versus settling, home lost versus home found, being adrift and on the run versus knowing one's place. And so here comes roaming. No one needs us to tell us where we should stay, stay adrift on the wings 
of a hummingbird, hawk, moth, humming audibly and hovering in mid-air. No place in mid-air to stay where we should trust, come or go on our own wings only, hovering and humming. Good omen, they said, even in the rain. Even in the rain flight, over waste, or bounty settled, unsettled, by visual discrimination reached, unreached, by convergent evolution. The endless ending, the flight, endless, always floating, floating, flying away. No one needs us and we are peregrine. Thank you. Hey folks. So that was our final reader for the evening. And now is where I invite you all to unmute yourself and give a rousing round of applause for all of these contributors who were prepared. Yes. Yay. How incredible. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So we do have a few minutes. Um, so we could take some questions if anyone wants to ask a question about the pieces here, any questions about the issue itself. Um, Annie has dropped the link in the chat for where you can find this beautiful issue. So if you don't have it, we'd love for you to pick it up. There are hard copies. There are also PDF copies for folks who like, like to have a digital copy. Um, and any, is there anything else you'd like to share about the issue or things happening at Yellow Arrow? Um, no, just thank you to all of our wonderful contributors. This is just such a lovely issue. Um, just from the cover art through every piece, we were just so thrilled with it and so happy to welcome all of you to the Yellow Arrow family of contributors. And um, I said in the beginning, um, Rachelle has just been so wonderful to work with as a guest editor of this issue. We've just loved having her and she's um, teaching a workshop with us next year, an ongoing series uh, monthly. So check that out in our bookstore. She, I took a workshop with her um, earlier this year, and she's just so um, welcoming and warm, and it's um, going to be a really great workshop we're excited about. So if you need some additional uh, writing inspiration, that's a, a great opportunity. And um, we publish the journal twice a year, so um, we would love to have all of you and all of the um, folks joining to see the reading who may also be writers um, take a look when we announce our theme and submit and yeah, just so thrilled to have all of you here join us for the reading. Thank you, Annie. And I saw there was a, a request in the chat for writers to drop their uh, social. So writers, if you want to share ways for folks to get in touch with you, either Facebook, IG, TikTok, if you have a website, please do drop those in the chat so that folks can get in touch with you. I also strongly encourage folks here to submit to Yellow Arrow. Before I was a guest editor, I submitted to the journal and I was just delighted to have my work published there. Um, this is an amazing team of folks who come together twice a year to support women writers or women identifying writers. And I think it's just such a beautiful space that they have created here. And, any support that we can offer with our work, with our time, with our energy, I think is well, well used. <laughs> um, and folks are dropping their handles in the chat. I encourage everyone, anytime you come to these kinds of events to save the chat, especially writers. There were some wonderful affirmations for your work in the chat. So you can do that by just hitting those three dots next to um, the little smiley face. Um, and if we don't have any questions, I think we can close our reading out. And I'll just say thank you again to everyone who contributed. 
Thank you again to everyone who came to share with, in this writer's work. And thank you to Yellow Arrow for putting out such amazing writing, <laughs> especially in this issue. Peregrine, yeah. <laughs>